guys, what's up? On today's episode, I spoke with Sabia Prince and Sarah Schofield. We are all part of the Berry Farms Hillsdale Legacy Project Advisory Committee. And this committee was formed in response to the December 2019 decision of DC Historic Preservation Review Board to award historic landmark status to five buildings at the Berry Farms dwellings. There's tons and tons of black history at Berry Farms Hillsdale community, including, and I didn't even know this, black landowners that dates back to the founding of the community in like 1867. And and the purchase of this land helped finance the creation of Howard University. And that's just one example of tons of history in this community. So in response to the 2019 decision to award five of these buildings as a historic landmark status brought a whole bunch of us together. Part of what we're tasked to do is to document former residents and in a form of like storytelling and Sabia Prince along with another person their names escape me right now I do apologize they created this documentary that's coming out soon I can't wait to share that when that comes out and then of course Sarah last year with uh, Prologue DC with Mapping Segregation so check that podcast episode out I, I linked it in the show notes for you but yeah so we we talked about the history of Berry Farms in Hillsdale, the, the documentary and the residents. And we talked about gentrification. That's always a, a nice, juicy topic. We also gave a couple of shout outs to shout out to Empower DC. Shout out to Amber Wiley, who podcast episode I will also tag in the show notes, as well as uh, Nikita Reed, who has her own podcast called Tangible Remnants. You should check that out. I think that's that's about it. I'm going to go ahead and just bring you the episode. So here you go. Hi, ladies. Good morning. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. I am talking to Oli Bagudi, Sarah Schofeld, and Sabia Prince. Tell me more about you. Sure. I'm a cultural anthropologist. I'm a native Washingtonian. I am a qualitative researcher and a visual artist. And uh, my research has looked at economic change and gentrification in Central and West Harlem. That's what I did my doctoral dissertation on. Came back home and was eager to begin to do some ethnographic research in my hometown. And I wrote a book called African Americans and Gentrification in Washington, DC, that was based on numerous years of qualitative research, hanging out with organizers, collecting oral histories, and just chilling in people's kitchens and dining rooms and living rooms, learning more about their experiences with gentrification and other forms of demographic change here in Washington, D.C., the city formerly known as Chocolate, as I like to refer to it. (laughs) Chocolate City. So I am bringing together this dynamic duo so that we can talk about Berry Farms. Thanks to Sarah, she hooked me up with an amazing group of people who have a passion of telling the story of the residents as Berry Farms. And there's a project going on right now that these two women are a part of. Well, Sarah wears many hats and one hat is to do some research on Berry Farms. And I just want Sarah to you to talk about what you've discovered. Sure. I, I'll say I'm, I'm a longtime sort of local historian of DC neighborhoods, and I've been working in the capacity of, of like this project called Mapping Segregation in Washington, DC, looking at sort of the historic intersection of race and housing. And that's kind of how I came to look at sort of the history of public housing in the district and also became involved more in advocacy around a displacement of public housing residents today and was involved in writing a landmark nomination to have a set of buildings at Berry Farm historically designated, meaning they will never, they can't be torn down. It doesn't mean that we saved them for residents to live in and all of the residents have been displaced from that site and the rest of the buildings have been demolished. But we did save this set of public housing buildings and we made a case for saving them based on this very rich history at, at Berry Farm and the community called Hillsdale, which is what the residents named that, that community. It was much more 
expansive that, than just the public housing. Beginning in 1867, the federal government purchased land specifically for Black land ownership for people who had been enslaved or descendants of slaves to, to live and own their own land, build houses, and build a community. And that began in 1867. I will link our our previous episode of Mapping Segregation that we talked last year. It was, wow, last year. And I was intrigued about the preservation efforts and how Amber Wiley got involved. And there's also another conversation I had with Amber. I also linked that in the chat too, and how she got involved with with Berry Farms. After that designation, would you say that that really kick-started this effort of what it will look like and what is it that we're going to do with this area? Yeah, I mean, we were really pleased to get this set of buildings preserved. And the next step would be to then transform them into a a space that does speak to the history that we want to uplift. So we formed, I guess, over the past hmm, six months to to a year. I think it was mostly last summer that we did this, this past summer and spring and summer that we did this work on forming this committee of around 30 people to serve as an advisory committee for what we are calling the DC Legacy Project or Berry Farm Hillsdale Legacy Project. I say DC Legacy Project because th- this may ultimately encompass other sites. Berry Farm Hillsdale is just one example of where this history has played out. We've received a couple of grants to move forward with creating a, a, a vision for what this this site should be creating a website. Sibi is working on a film project. So all of these things are are sort of to build momentum for transforming this space. We're going to be really looking toward to former residents of the area to help inform the vision of what the site will be. How did you and Sibia get connected? How did we get connected, Sibia? I would say <laughs> that it was probably through Empower DC. And, and I want to pause and really commend Sarah and Amber Wiley and other historians, but you know, you two and Sarah in particular have been so instrumental working with Empower DC to really broaden out and, and inform the community about this rich history that's right here that we walk with every day. I'm a native and I didn't know anything about the history of Berry Farm. All I knew was the very kind of stigmatized and stereotypical, you know, ways that people have of talking about public housing. So, you know, really big up to the historians who've been doing a lot of that work. I mean, the people are living representations of this history, but somebody needs to gather it, put it together and form. And that's the work that she's done. And it's been very transformative for me personally. And I believe we met through Empower DC. It was through your various presentations that you've done with them that I initially became familiar with your work. So that's a grassroots, a local grassroots organization that I was initially on the board for. I've been a member since 2004 and was on staff for a period of time. And they've been really instrumental in amplifying local history as a part of their advocacy around helping vulnerable populations in Washington, D.C. And for our audience, Empower D.C. is a nonprofit organization, correct? It's a nonprofit organizing firm, if you will. I mean, Mm -hmm. they're more than activists. They mobilize people locally to advocate for themselves and really push for change in a number of different areas. They have a very comprehensive view about community wellness and the kind of work that needs to be done to make sure that people can stay in place in a rapidly changing city and also flourish. Did you guys get together separately <clears throat> prior to the Berry Farms Initiative or was it basically you know, I, because of that? I was just thinking as Sabia was talking that I think I first encountered her through her work around gentrification, writing and talking about the impact of gentrification on longtime residents, longtime Black residents of D.C. through her book and her I, they believe that you co-edited a book, Sabia, called Capital Dilemma with Derek Hira. Yeah. And right. you, then you were doing a lot of, at that time when that book came out, which is a whole set of really great essays by, by a variety of scholars in different disciplines around the history and impact of gentrification in DC. And you were doing a lot of like speaking engagements and things like that. So I think that's where I first encountered your work. Okay. Uh, and it was really important for informing my work because when we originally, when we started looking at the history of racially restrictive deed covenants and how that kind of shaped the city. We really didn't know that much about how like 
I mean, we obviously could see before our eyes what was happening to the city today, but how to talk about it and like in a more comprehensive way and connect the what was happening now to the history that we were documenting. So that's, it's been a kind of a, a journey that you were an integral part of. <laughs> so, yeah, so we have this mutual admiration thing yeah. going on. <laughs> we won't sicken you with it. <laughs> Sarah asked Sabia to be part of this group. This is what I'm understanding it to be, or you guys. I think were we were pro- both approached. We were both approached by Empower DC to kind okay. of lead up. We had landmarked the buildings and then like, where it's like, okay, what we need to move forward. And Tabia and I were both tapped to, to put together a committee and to start doing this work. And, and we both agreed to do it. And that's where that's, yeah, <laughs> that's how that started. We have to give a shout out to Parisa Neruzzi of Empower DC because she's an organizer and executive director of that organization. And she has a knack for getting people to do things that they may or may not want to do. So I think, <laughs> yeah. kinda, you know, it's like once you see her calling you, it's like, oh God, what is she going to ask me to do now? And what am I going to agree to do? That's probably going to tax my schedule in my life, but I'm going to agree to do it anyway. So that's also a big part of the back. Yeah. And Sabia, you had also worked on worked with Empower on the Berry Farm Oral History Project, which is a series of interviews with people that have been displaced from Berry Farm in recent years. So you obviously knew knew know the site pretty well. Maybe not you didn't know the longer history as right. well, maybe, but yeah, yeah, I definitely learned it. I, I learned it there. And then I had the deep honor to um testify before the landmark committee, the whatever kind of zoning or preservation committee it was, the history was so meaningful to me. I was like choking up while I was mm-hmm. reading my own commentary. I mean, how, <laughs> how, you know, narcissistic is that? But, you know, I mean, I'm just like, in, I almost ended the whole thing in tears because that's how rich and important this history is, as well as, you know, the attempts to try to erase it or, or gloss over it are equally intense. So that's been a part of my journey getting to this point where I do now have a much deeper familiarity with the people and the history. So being a native here, what was the most impactful or knowledge that you gained in knowing the history of, of Berry Farms? Like what was the, the I guess, aha or the like, like for me, knowing that a woman designed Tower House was really impactful for me. The second, well, that's the architectural part, side, the, the native side, the black side of me, just to find out that a, a black church was developed and thought of and created Tower House. And out of a pure necessity of being able to house low-income families. So with you, like what was the what was the the oh wow, like I did not know that with, with Barry Farms. Probably the biggest aha would have been learning that the history actually goes back to the 19th century. So that was something I was completely unaware of. Again, I primarily was familiar with the public house, but, you know, learning about the role of the Freedmen's Bureau, that people actually built their homes there, that that was a part of the initial funding for Howard University. I mean, these are like explosive historical facts for me. I mean, I'm a cultural anthropologist, so very much kind of rooted in in the now. Mm -hmm. But, you know, culture has a context. It always has. I mean, that's a key part. If you're doing your due diligence as an anthropologist, you're putting everything within its broader context. And to ignore that or try to extricate the present from the past is just, you know, it's it's problematic and it's not going to lead to good scholarship. So I think those were some of the real uh, pivotal moments for me is just understanding that this history actually goes back quite a bit and its connection to enslavement and the Civil War. I think it's a powerful story about Black resilience, you know, Mm -hmm. and that's a story that my family members are a part of, you know, people who had very little education came up from the South to DC with the express desire to just make it, make it survive, have their children live and be able to flourish. So those things are very, very close to, to my heart, to the things that I value and overlap with my own family history. Me doing research of my area has would have 
empowered me back then, especially because, you know, the child of the 90s, knowing that Black people had good intentions in that area and maybe would help others to understand that as well. Do you think moving forward in making this project a success that it would help the community at large? And not just, I mean, again, former Chocolate City, right? I look at the city broadly and there really isn't physical representation of Black DC. I mean, what is it? Like Ben's Chili Bowl? Like there's no physical, or maybe the big chair, maybe those two areas I can like immediately think of that says this is the culture of DC. Can you think of another area that's a physical, I don't know, building or an artifact that would say this is DC? Gosh, well, I guess there's layers to your question. I mean, yeah, I think that the history has the power to empower people. And it's definitely a a ball has been dropped and an opportunity has been missed to not incorporate that rich history from long ago into the curricula, right? So, you know, I was educated at Bunker Hill Elementary, Bacchus Middle School, Junior High was called. And, you know, we never got any of this information. And I know that that information could have been transformative in my life back then, just as it has the potential to be transformative today in the lives of young people. We have schools that are named after all these interesting people who were freedom fighters. And that information needs to be known. I think, you know, if they were to do that, you're you're tapping into the personal experience of the children. So that could have had a powerful impact. And then... To answer the second part of your question, I mean, you know, the history is there's a whole bunch of different neighborhoods and every neighborhood, I'm sure, has its landmarks. I grew up in North Michigan Park where, um, well, first I was in Lamont Riggs and then we had a little bit of moving on up situation where we kind of went into a, a three bedroom house in North Michigan Park. And right around there is Black history. You, you had one of the oldest, the first McDonald's in Washington, D.C. Okay, that's corporate history, but, you know, it overlaps with our experiences of going to these places. When I was four years old, my brother was eight. On Fridays, he used to take my hand at night, and we would walk down there and get dinner for our family. Every community probably has, if you really tap into it and do some of those oral histories, you can probably find out about different landmarks and areas that are meaningful to people. Yes, there are probably others that are meaningful citywide. The big chair is certainly one of them. I mean, I can remember driving past that, riding past it as a little kid and just being awestruck by that giant chair. Right. You know? <laughs> I mean, I used to think like, you know, where there was a giant, you know, that used to live there. Right. Your imagination <laughs> just went wild as a kid, right? Totally. <laughs> Totally. There's Georgetown that had a lot of Black folks living there. When my grandfather came here, that's exactly where he went. And some of that stuff has been torn down. You have Black churches that were established that now people have, now they're commuter churches, or maybe they're not even there anymore. You know, I mean, I feel you, what you're saying there, but I think really if we dig deeper, we'll probably find other landmarks and and other symbols that resonate with people that speak to their belonging or their place in that area and in the city as a whole. Prior to me hitting record, I mentioned that the purpose of this podcast and how I'm often in this constant dilemma of studying architecture, working in architecture, and how I grew up in my own personal environments and how there's this, this clash between the two, when you were talking about the symbolisms, these hidden treasures, I, I, I want to say that it really is, of, of the Black community and what we defined as, like you said, like the McDonald's or other little things. But on the other side, there's like the National Planning Commission and this other entity that actually has the, the hole on DC and actually dictates what DC will look like in the future. And I'm jumping on Sarah with this. I feel like you've seen also these two different sides, what Congress has done to all the way up to what the city council is doing versus the community that you're engaging yourself in. Do you 
am I imagining things? Like, do you see a, a stark difference in the two, like how they're separate or do you see any commonalities in the two or? I mean, I think, hmm, yeah, there's definitely a dangerous level of erasure of physical manifestations of the history of Black DC, I think. And in, in some cases, because many of those um, buildings that are associated with DC's Black history are not necessarily considered like architecturally notable or because of disinvestment and in areas where a lot of those places are located, like the buildings might not be in good condition. I mean, Barry Pharmacist is the perfect example of that, right? Like it's a very remarkable really that, that these buildings that are so in such poor condition were designated at all as historic landmarks because of what happened there, because what happened in that area and in in those buildings and who lived in them. So there is like more of a push now. I mean, I've been involved in other, I'm involved in a much larger project around surveying sites all over the city that could be saved based on uh, their relationship to civil, you know, civil rights organizing in DC historically with Nikita Reed, who I think you know, at at Quinn Evans, we surveyed, we came up with a list of around 130 sites that have significant civil rights history. But like to look at a lot of these buildings, you wouldn't know any, you know, what happened there. On the preservation side, there's definitely greater recognition of the importance of the social history of sites as as relevant to, as a reason to save them. But yeah, our historic preservation office is within the DC Office of Planning which is the agency that is leading the way in, in gentrifying the city. And that, you know, that really came to the fore in the debate over whether to designate Berry Farm because you had the city's historic preservation office. On the one hand, it is their job to preserve historic sites. And on the other hand, they are within an agency that's run by the mayor who did not want to preserve that site. And so there was like these lengthy negotiations between our team that was working on the preservation side, the Empower DC and the Berry Farm Tenants and Allies Association, and the other you know partners that were working with us and the Washington Lawyers Committee with the developers over like, you know, well, if, you know, we, the developers would be, if we do this, you know, then would you with, basically trying to get us with, to withdraw the nomination by making concessions to the ways that they would display the history within the new development. And all of this was facilitated by the Historic Preservation Office, which I found confusing and didn't seem to me should be their job to be negotiating with the developers. So I, that's kind of a weedsy answer to that question. I guess. <laughs> but I will say on the, on the other question about Black historic sites, the Cromel School is a great example of another site that has been saved and finally now is going to become a recreation center after 20. I mean, this was the very first project that Empower DC got involved with in Ivy City, saving this beautiful historic Black school named for uh, a very important leader, Alexander Cromel, who was a minister, Pan Africanist, was called by W.E.B. Du Bois a prophet. So many generations of Black Washingtonians went to that school, um, but it was boarded up for so long. It was just like, oh, this is just like an abandoned site that has no meaning at all, you know? Mm-hmm. So it's finally like that building was preserved and now it's finally going to, it's going to stay and be, and actually serve the community. So that would be like one example of, of success, another successful example of one of those sites, at least. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And then Amber, I mean, is doing really interesting work around looking at DC public school buildings that were built later in the 60s and Woodson, for example, and the architectural value of those sites also based sort of on the social history, but sites that have, have, you know, not necessarily been considered for worthy of, of recognition. Thank you for that, Sarah. I'm deeply, deeply regretful that I mentioned McDonald's. Oh, I know. no, because I, that's like, no, no, I, it, I, there you go. Like that McDonald's is really important for like what that, I mean, for that community. And like, you know, there's been a whole book recently written about the history of McDonald's. Okay. And no, like, yeah, <laughs> I mean, uh, Martha Chatelaine. Yeah. 
<laughs> I mean, the, I, mean I, I don't, I don't mean the sidetrack here, but how like the stigma of the fast food is like bad for you and all that stuff. But back in the day, they actually used real meat to fry the burgers and real potatoes for the French fries. <laughs> they used the correct products, but due to capitalism, it became unhealthy. Eating a hamburger with lean meat won't kill you. It's the process, the 10% beef <laughs> that's in this burger that's harmful. But I, again, with the digression, um, there's Dave Thomas Circle right when you go to right off of New York Avenue when you're heading into the district or like around that Noma area and how DC paid like 1.2 whatever million dollars to Wendy's and use intimate domain to remove Wendy's from that circle so that they can make the traffic flow better and create some green space. I think that the type of food they're serving notwithstanding, it's important to think about some of these spaces as places where people can come together, right? And that's where it has meaning. And particularly, I'm talking about back in the 60s where there were a lot more limitations on that, places where Black people could go and feel comfortable, you know? And, and actually, sadly, McDonald's, I did an ethnographic piece of a McDonald's in Harlem that was actually owned by two Black women. And the elders would come there every day. Mm. That was a rich site to sit and talk with elders because they would gather there to get their affordable food for breakfast, right? So it does have meaning in that sense. And then for us, my mom was a school teacher who later got her master's degree. Imagine the hard work. So darn Skippy, we were going to McDonald's for dinner because she didn't have time to make, you know, the meals all the time. Mm -hmm. Limited. That's right in our neighborhood. So it's a hop, skip and a jump. So, yeah, there are a lot of layers culturally and historically to some of these spaces that may not be specifically, obviously related to African-American history and culture. And then Check. these were these. So going back to Berry Farms, Sabia, what is your role right now? Well, I'm excited to be asked to be on the um, steering committee. So I'm a part of the larger group as well as the smaller group. And specifically right now, what I'm doing is for our committee project directing the documentary that we are tentatively, haven't told Sarah about this, but tentatively titling in my mind, Our Roots Run Deep, the history of Berry Farm and Hillsdale community. So I've been working with filmmaker Sam George to interview people. We have a list of about 16 or more people. We've talked to nine. We have some more. And we've been traveling around not only the city, but also parts of Maryland where Native Washingtonians are now living and um, asking them questions about their relationship to Berry Farm, what they think about it. So far, we've talked to former residents, curators, historians, the director of the African-American Civil War Museum, Frank Smith, descendants whose families have lived there and are tied to a very rich history. We've spoken to actually three descendants of the Pearl, which Sarah can tell you more about in detail, which was a ship where enslaved African-Americans attempted to self-emancipate out of enslavement and they were caught in Virginia. So well, I'm just being a part of this mission of elevating this history toward the goal of mobilizing people so they understand how important it is to preserve these buildings, but not only that, to also get resources to turn these buildings into a broader, wider research for the community to learn more about their history, but hopefully also to be able to maybe receive some sort of job training or arts education, or as Sarah again said, we're tapping into the needs and wants of the community to see precisely what they want to see there. But we definitely wanna see at the very least a museum and an archive. So producing this doc, which the whole steering committee team is a part of the production of this, is to get this documentary going so people can really understand just how important and how rich the Hillsdale uh, area and the Berry Farm dwellings are to African-American history here in DC. So that's kind of what I've been doing. And it's, it's been great. It has been a tremendous experience. I mean, some of the folks I've talked to will just blow your mind, you know, they just go back so far. And I was telling you when we initially 
um, were speaking before the recording began that the last interview I did was with a gentleman named Enoch Gilbert, who's 90 some odd years old, visually impaired. He was a hoot. I got to say that. <laughs> I mean, he kept us on our feet because he was like, who are you people and why are you in our house? So. <laughs> The filmmaker and I were just looking at each other, you know, you have on your mask. So it's just like your eyes and our eyes are just like sparkling. We're like, okay, this is, this is going to be great. You know? And yeah, he came to Berry Farm in 1942. He told us they were dirt roads when he wow. came from Virginia with no running water, no electricity, and just what Berry Farm meant to him, you know, is far beyond any stigma and, and stereotype that you can envision. It was home. It was freedom. It was community. And these are the kind of lessons that I'm learning, um, speaking to former residents and people who are descendant from folks who lived in the area many, many decades ago. So it sounds like Sabia, he lived in the, the community outside of the public housing. No, he said he lived in the actual public housing. He lived in Berry Farm. His wife lived in the Hillsdale area. So okay. she was on Howard. But he, he was on either Sumner or another street. He said that there were, maybe he was saying the surrounding areas had no right. paved roads. They were okay. just dirt roads. And he talked about playing in the, the alley spaces and the like, in the actual community. One thing that, again, uh, prior conversation to me hitting record, that was, that was a pleasant to hear was that no one was negative at all in, about the area. Yes, Sarah, I was telling Melissa about not only this experience, but also the DC Humanities Council grant that Empower DC received a few years back where I did, I think it was about eight oral histories. And um, yeah, people did not talk about crime. That, that literally never came up. And for this documentary, Sam George, the co-director was saying things like, we don't want this to be propagandistic. So we really need to kind of broaden our view of this community. Because when people look at this documentary, they're going to think, oh, wow, they're kind of glossing over all the kind of negative things that people immediately think about. And I'm like, Sam, we can't drag this out of people if they don't have anything negative to say. They don't have mm -hmm. anything negative to say. Most of the commentary is always circling back to community, to belonging, to playing. They talk about ice cream trucks and playing games and playing sports, being safe and not locking their doors and staying over people's house for dinner and just everybody kind of knowing one another. And these are the kind of stories that keep emerging, you know, that I've collected both in oral histories and in the making of the documentary is those are the themes that keep resurfacing over and over again. Wow. It got me thinking about what people in the community experience versus the outsiders and what people think of what that community is, is experiencing. My mom sheltered me. Like I stayed in the house. I didn't get a chance to play outside because my mom didn't want me to get in, I don't know, get in trouble or create trouble or like whatever. And because I stayed in the house, I observed a lot of things outside the window, outside the balcony, or what was on the news. I lived in fear. And it's interesting to hear that your community didn't talk about that. It was just like one, that one traumatic experience kind of oversees all the positive experiences. I'm just thinking about that. Maybe there's something for me to look into or re-examine. But that's, you know, well, I think this happens though when you're speaking with people. I mean, to some extent, conversations can be curated. I mean, it's not to say that there aren't those negative experiences there. I think the point is perhaps that folks are tired of the tropes and tired of this kind of one narrative that pertains to their community. So they don't feel like talking about that. I mean, sometimes when you dig deeper and deeper, you do get that. But I just feel that there's perhaps a reluctance to want to go there with that because those are commonplace tropes that we hear all the time. And people want to give another story. And that happens sometimes. And I think that's a good thing about anthropology 
is that if you're engaging with people for an extended period of time, you get to get the full narrative. Maybe speak to them another day, speak to them a third day and actually do participant observation where you actually see what's going on. So I don't want to leave the impression that there aren't, I mean, obviously there were challenges and the very things that brought you to feel fearful, I'm sure there were issues and sometimes they were discussed, but they just were not prioritized. They weren't centered. That wasn't the primary story that people wanted to convey yeah. about their community because that's the stuff that people already know. That's the mm-hmm. existing narrative that exists in, in journalism and the Washington Post, et cetera. Those are the first things that people think about. And I think people want us to know our community is a lot more than that. You've already gotten that piece. What I want to share with you is that this was largely a community of working class people who just want to not only survive, but also thrive. And that's really what they wanted to share. So I, I definitely don't want to leave the impression that that other piece was not there. And sometimes it did come up, but again, it just, it wasn't centered. Mm-hmm. I'm curious, switching topics again about Sabine, of your, your experience with architecture. What do you think about that? Like, what do you, anything at all? Like, I'm just kind of curious, curious about that. Moi, me? Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> <My experience. laughs> yeah, like um, that was to be a condition for coming on the show. She was like, "I will come on the show as long as I don't have to talk about architecture." <laughs> she said that really. <laughs> <laughs> now here you go. <laughs> but I know you like to get people's non-architects impression I'm curious if, if you don't have yeah. any then that's fine you don't have to think about it I'm not looking for anything you know HGTV was it and that's it Let's move on. I mean I know I've experienced it because I've walked in buildings and I've looked around and I said oh I'm in a building <laughs> and someone designed this but <laughs> I mean I guess there are things that resonate with me that make me feel good and that make me recognize my surroundings, perhaps. And those things are open spaces and green spaces and spaces that are welcoming to others. But as a native, as you are, and as Sarah is as well, I mean, DC is just a, a beautiful place to grow up in. It's a place that's surrounded by very stately and majestic buildings, at least in a, you know, certain segments of the city. And, you know, that's something that it, it resonates with you. It, it represents place for me. And again, you know, born and raised. So you, you kind of see that stuff all around. I mean, that, that's pretty much all I got. I mean, if you- how about architects? Have you, have you interacted with any at all or in your lifetime? Not a lot. Not a lot. No. no, I can't say that I have. I yeah. I, Any black ones at all? Or I do remember just very briefly dating a guy. We had like one date, and it was pretty bad. And no, I'm sure that's no reflection on it. Is field. it is it's absolutely <laughs> is. Trust me, it is. Yeah, I can remember <laughs> actually kind of leaving early and just saying, you know, I'm out. I'm just. <laughs> I'm going to go hail a cab because this is like, no, sadly, sadly, I don't, I don't have enough. I could, I will say that both my father and my uncle were very, very good drawers. I think my dad could have been an engineer because they drew really well. They had like kind of draftsman kind of mm. um, skills mm-hmm. that I believe are associated with architecture in some way. So. so what do you think about the whole gentrification movement that's happening in DC? Oh gosh. How much time do you have? <laughs> but, um, but it's interesting how you didn't equate gentrification with architects at all. You, you, you equate them with developers, you equate them with the city, like. You know, I obviously, I, you know, I understand how architects are a part of this. When I think gentrification, probably the first thing I think about is policymakers, mm. you know, because for me, gentrification is a policy driven process that folds in architects, developers, but at its core for me, it's about, I guess, a few things. One, marginalization and and neglect because the areas would not be ripe for gentrification if they weren't disinvested in in the first place. And that's a policy decision. I mean, 
all the redlining and the myriad for other forms of discrimination that have led to the formation of underserved areas, ghettoization, where the primary population are all of one racial ethnic group. So I immediately think of that, you know, because for me, I define gentrification as the influx of, influx of resources into previously neglected and marginalized areas, usually urban ones. And what happens when those resources come in as well as the people who have access to them. So for me, that's what gentrification is. It's very much policy driven. And that's probably the first thing that comes to mind. Politicians of many different backgrounds, people who look like me and people who don't, doling out corporate welfare, giving benefits to their donors. I've looked at the members of the city council, public information, where they get the most of their donations from. And it's no accident that the ones who get a large percentage of their donations from developers, from the real estate industry, are also those politicians that are pushing pro-gentrification policies. So that's probably the first things that come to my mind. And I'm sure I understand architects are implicated in that process because mm -hmm. they're the ones that are designing the buildings. They're working for someone else. Right? Sarah, I know I asked you this question, the same question. Has your perception changed at all? Oh, about architecture? Yeah, it's been a whole year. I know, oh, I not really. Yeah, I, I don't have, I don't think I have anything really new to say about it. I mean, I think architects are benefiting greatly from all this redevelopment. Oh, sure. yeah. They're not necessarily, I guess. Yeah, I mean, that, <laughs> that question came up for me the last time we talked, like, is there like, uh, like a white aesthetic, right? Because we were talking about like all the glass and all the transparent right. built, like, you know, something I've been thinking about lately, I think I commented on this to you, Sabia, recently when we we're on the roof of the new, the newly renovated MLK library has this beautiful roof deck. So you can get this great view of all the, you know, some histor historic churches and the Smithsonian American Art Museum, National Portrait Gallery, but like all these glass buildings too. You're up high, but you can see this from the street too. You just see people in their um, spaces, in their private spaces, right? Because they're living in buildings where their entire outside wall is just glass and that's clear. Not only is you have this kind of feeling that gentrification is bringing in all these people and all this wealth that's occupying formerly black space in DC, but it's like they're occupying even more space by being visible to the rest of us all the time. I want people to just it doesn't seem right. Somehow that seems wrong to me. I'm like, <laughs> you're in a glass building. Like just, <laughs> we don't, you're already got this space, but you also have to be visible. That's something I've just been thinking about lately. And we were just talking about, yeah, people are really okay with that. You walk around a lot of older neighborhoods and people have their shades pulled like all the time, you know, and you can't well, see inside at all. depends on who's in the house. Yeah. It, yeah. I it mean, does. yeah, it does. Because black people don't mm -hmm. have their windows open out <laughs> so you can see inside. That's just... But that's right. such a valuable point, Sarah. I mean, in though that type of approach here, because those condos and these giant buildings with big windows are now in the community. And it's so funny that you say that it's almost like they're on display and they're displaying their... It's not so much opulence, but it certainly is a form of privilege, right? Because yeah. you look into their home and you can see the furnishings that you have. You can see their big TVs and you can see them kind of lounging. And I'm thinking to myself, number one, who wants to be on display like this? But I didn't even think about the fact that they're kind of promoting almost like their privilege in a way. Right. Hmm. It's this very confident kind of like, look at me. It's just an attitude which seems very sort of an arrogance, I guess, about. I never thought of it that way. On my end, it's just letting light in, right? right? We need more natural light so you can see outside so that you can feel better, right? I would only do that if I live in the woods by myself and there's no other house, like 50 miles away. Psychological, I guess, people want to see outside to make themselves feel better. But it's like, who's this, who did you use in the study? Because it depends on where you are. If I'm in the city and I see a homeless guy taking a piss in the street, that's a different feeling. You understand what I mean? Or if I look out and I see another office building, 
that has also like floor to ceiling glass, then that's a different view. Who are we designing for? And who are these designers who, who are making these decisions? So, I mean, I've gone down streets and seen people laying in their beds looking at television. I don't need to see that. That's your business. But yeah, there's definitely something operating there. And you're right. It's built into the design because you can bring light in. You don't have to necessarily accomplish that with floor to ceiling glass, but, you know, and the impacts are different when people are closer to the street versus, you know, perhaps higher up. I mean, I went Mm -hmm. to a building called the Silva. I don't know if you guys have seen it. It's a newly opened building on Columbia Road and 16th Street. Mm -hmm. They have an art gallery on the first floor. And I went to an opening there. Part of the experience was taking folks up to see one of the empty um, condo units I don't know if it was a condo or an apartment, but wow, the rent was five grand a month. For, for the art for the artist space or for the you no, know, for the actual apartment. It was a two-bedroom unit that had two small bedrooms and one kind of a space that incorporated the kitchen, the dining room, and a kind of family room sort of a configuration where a television was there and the you know, a seating lounging area was there and the views were gorgeous. And this was up on the sixth floor. So the impact of having all the glass is a little different, at least, you know, from the point of people being able to see what you're doing. And yeah, and there were grand views of Mm. of 16th street Mm. and some of the church steeples and the like that were there. Five grand a month. Yeah. Yeah. So you really gotta be making that money. So for that. They make shmoney. Shmoney. <laughs> and I don't know who could have. They got to be an architect. Apparently no, they're not. <laughs> no. I can tell you that. They're not an architect. <laughs> a developer. <laughs> Definitely a developer. <laughs> not an architect. We get, we get um out of the construction costs, we probably get like two, three percent of that. So, wow. I mean, it's. It's, it's pennies. One last thing before we go, Sabia, you're an artist. And I had this epiphany the other day about, it's not an epiphany, but I interviewed another architect and he, he's, he's on the artistic side too. Something that I have always envied because he has the ability of taking art and turning it into architecture. Something similar to like the African American Museum where the panels was inspired by something, by his travels to Africa or whatever. How has art translates itself in the district for you or you creating art in in the district? How is that different from New York or LA or like how how is that different? I'm I'm sorry about pushing up this question. Can you ask the, ask me that question again? I know, right? <laughs> how? I don't know. Like, um, how does like what being a native Washingtonian or being in the district inform her art? Yeah, your like art. That one. Yeah. Gosh, there's so much that I'm motivated by. I mean, I'm very intuitive with my work, and I'm fairly emotional, as I've tried. I've probably <laughs> indicated. So, I feel a lot of different stuff. And I incorporate both my native status as well as, you know, I mean, I'm very intersectional. So, I mean, you know, I feel I'm concerned about a lot of different issues. So I think my art is more a reflection of the extent to which DC is implicated. It's really you know, my identity and my experiences. I think those are the things that inform me and my emotions. So I'm concerned about inequality, broadly configured. I'm concerned about racism and patriarchy and homophobia and transphobia and class inequality and kind of all that stuff is all in in here and in here and kind of motivates me. And I'm a product of this city. I'm a product of the history of this city, you know? So I think in that way, that's how it probably affects my art. You know, DC is a very rich artistic 
community. It's a smaller city compared to others, but in terms of the talent that's here and the energy that he is here, it's very, very rich and it's very, very layered. And people are expressing that in a number of different ways. I will say that I love murals. There's a plethora of murals around now. And one thing that bothers me about that is I'm concerned that we may get to a point where the only Black people in the city are going to be in murals. And that, that bothers me. You know, I really want to see concerted efforts at making a sustained Black presence possible and a part of our future. I don't think that the creation of murals is any sort of a substitute for that. There's definitely that attitude. And, and I... I'm on the fence about that a little bit because they're important, they're valuable, they are stimulating, they're beautiful to see, but it's no um, substitute for the actual people. It's like there are more and more murals, less and less Black people. That's not a trend I want to see. <laughs> right. right. You know, continuing. And I also think that just the space to exhibit as a visual artist like myself, you know, there are definitely some limitations around here, around that. And if I may add, there are some folks that are pushing for art residences for artists and the like, and that that is some sort of a solution for the housing crisis that we're experiencing and the displacement of largely, you know, working class people from the city. And that's problematic too. I don't think that's a solution. I think what we're going to see for folks who are advocating for that is it's going to be a lot of stipulations because who gets to call themselves an artist, you know, in the broader world is that you have to have some sort of an artistic resume, an artistic statement, and also a history of exhibiting in galleries, you know, galleries that take, you know, 30 to 50 percent of the proceeds of your work, you know, which I understand they have to continue to run and exist. But, you know, there's art, there's all kinds of art. And in places like New York, the street art is super, super rich and super, super plentiful. And I'm not talking murals that are commissioned by grants and the like. I am just mean like art that's there. Somebody's put it up on the wall. Maybe they've wheat pasted and the like. And some of that is taking place in D.C. too. But that's really the bottom up and the community-based stuff that I really want to support and not just the kind of, you know, gallery kind of work that really credentials artists in a certain way and allows them to kind of experience some of that upper mobility and really be designated and recognized by a large, you know, group as an actual artist, right? Mm -hmm. Wow. Do you have a scheduled date for the documentary or any, are we looking at 2024, 2025, or next we're week looking, <laughs> we're looking at january 2022 okay great that was the last conversation i had with sam that we hope to wrap up the interviews in early november and oh. then go into editing and color correction and we want to add some animation you know and so that's that's what we're looking at where in that month i'm not sure but that we're hopeful that will be done by then. I can't wait. I will definitely have you back on along with uh, Sam and we can talk about this documentary, try to get the word out. Any last words, Sarah? Do you want to plug anything? Do you want to, any call of action or anything? What do I want to say? I do want to say that the DC History Conference is going to be <laughs> happening in March, end of March of 2022. I'm hoping that that we'll be able to showcase the, the film project or other aspects of the Berry Farm Hills Dell Legacy Project at that conference. I just wanted to comment on like... I'm really excited for this film because I think back to the the... The hearing that Sibi was describing getting so choked up at the before when we testified before the Historic Preservation Review Board to landmark the buildings at Berry Farm and all the people that came out to testify and also just that listen that were there listening to the deep history of this community because a lot of people didn't really know about the 19th, you know, the earlier history and people were just so moved and Many people were moved to testify that hadn't planned to. So, and that was really transformational because I don't think they would have designated those buildings. They, they wouldn't have designated them based on what they look like. It was very much about the importance of this history to DC and that these were the only buildings left to, to convey that history because 
There's nothing left from that 19th century community. I think the film project is going to reinvigorate that conversation, bring this to a much wider audience. And so I'm just really excited about it. And yeah, I'll leave it there. <laughs> Any last words, uh, Sabia? Well, I guess I, you know, echo what Sarah said. I think anyone that I tell the film project about and the history that I didn't know, these are a lot of Native people, they, Native Washingtonians specifically, they didn't know that. So they get really excited about it. They're like, oh my gosh, you know, I, I didn't know. I had no idea. And so I think, you know, just multiply that by however many people we're going to be able to reach with the documentary. It's can, I'm hoping it's going to be a very powerful tool. And I'm um, looking forward to sharing it um, with the broader community. I think it could potentially be very transformative and be a very key part of our toolbox in fighting, not only for Berry Farm, but really for all the myriad communities that are vulnerable and that are facing displacement right now. And um, I'm honored that you've asked us to be here. I want to thank you um, for inviting us. Thank you for giving us this platform. Thank you, Sarah for unfolding me in. Thank you ladies so much for just coming on and telling me your stories. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. This was a great conversation. Hey, thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye now. Hey listeners, I have an exciting announcement. I decided to launch a membership program for the show where you have a chance to support me and the show directly. I love creating the show. And it means the world to me that you all tune in to keep hearing me week after week. But it takes an immense amount of time and energy to produce. I want to keep the show going and I want to invest in its growth. And I also want you to become a partner with me in this journey. That's why I'm excited to give you a chance to officially become a supporter of the show at glow.fm slash arch is poly A-R-C-H-I-S. P-O-L-L-Y, or by clicking the link in the show notes. It's quick and easy. It takes less than 30 seconds and just takes clicking a link in the show notes and using Apple or Google Pay. You don't have to create any new logins and you can contribute as much or as little as you like. If this show is part of your day or week and you like what I'm doing, then visit glow.fm slash archespoly, all one word, and support me and the show in any way you can today.